Hey, good afternoon, Scott Luton and special guest host Mike Griswold with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. Mike, how are you doing, sir? Hey, I'm great. I've never been referred to as a guest host, so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, you know, kidding aside, uh, so as our, fo our folks and family and community knows, uh, Mike Griswold is VP Analyst with Gartner, very highly respected world leader in uh, technology consulting and then some, but he's also... Uh, almost as important, one of our most popular repeat guests here at Supply Chain Now. And uh, we hear it all the time from our audience and, and community, all the questions and comments. And folks get their popcorn and Diet Cokes ready when we have Mike with us. But today is a little bit different. And Mike, we uncovered, I want to say a couple episodes ago, one of your appearances ago, that you've got a real enthusiasm and passion for the military and military history. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. It started with, um, you know, when we first lived in Massachusetts going to air shows, that got me interested in kind of military aviation. And it seems to get spurred, spurned on by books. So I mm -hmm. read Stephen Ambrose's book on D-Day and got really interested in, in D-Day and, and learning more about that. I read a book on the, the air war in Vietnam and got really interested in that. But probably the book that had the most impact on me personally was Lone Survivor. And then that got me into um, reading more and more about Afghanistan. Mm. Um, and it, it's just it's just been, you know, if you could see my bookshelf, it is populated with all kinds of military history books, primarily in those three areas. Well, unlike my bookshelf, you actually read the books on your bookshelf. So, uh, but Mike, really, as busy as you are and all of all the things you're doing, of course, one of the leading voices in global supply chain, I really appreciate your time here today as we have a really special episode teed up. Um, so on that note, we're going to say hello to all the folks pouring in. Uh, I love some of the comments already. Um, so today, folks, we're going to take a, it's going to be a little bit of a departure. So uh, as you may or may not know, Veteran Voices is one of our podcasts here where it's part of our Give Forward programming, right? As a fellow veteran, uh, since I got out in 2002, we've tried to find a variety of ways of giving back, amplifying the issues and the challenges and the journey of our fellow veterans. And today is going to be a Veteran Voices themed live stream episode of Supply Chain Now. So um, stay, stay, stay with us. It's going to be intriguing. It's going to be inspirational. You know, in light of the tragic events kind of playing out in Afghanistan here in recent weeks, um, some retired U.S. military members have been uh, taking it upon themselves to go in and help folks egress out of Afghanistan. Uh, some uh, Americans, Afghan allies and their families, and you name it. Talk about some, some treacherous missions, but noble missions. So today, we're going to hear firsthand from one of the brave leaders of the noble mission that continues. So stay tuned, intriguing, inspirational conversation. And Mike and I and the whole team is able to um, really honored to hear firsthand. So Mike, thanks so much for your partnership there. Are you, are you as, um, uh, you know, this, this came about really short notice, right? We, we, we had an opportunity to get a uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott man and, and was able to take advantage of it. But Mike, are you as, as, as uh, excited about this as I am? Uh, yes, Scott. Uh, in fact, when when the email when your email came across, I, I literally read it like five times to make sure that I was reading it with with the with the intent of of being able to talk uh, around this topic today. I, I feel incredibly honored to be able to to be just a small part of this conversation. The story is incredible. The work is incredible. The people are incredible, and. I mean, it's just a testament to to people seeing a challenge and wa wading into it and and finding ways to fix it. Right. It's right. it's it's a case where, you know, you think about um, the line from Apollo 13. Right. You know, failure is not an option. I mean, when, when you hear these stories, that's the mindset. And it, it just I feel incredibly honored to, to be able to spend some time with the, with the team today. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, I'm going to go ahead and pull these comments out. And, and you said it better than I could, Mike, but uh, Jenny Froome is with us. And of course, she's a leader of SAPIX based in South Africa. And she says uh, almost 60,000 people moved in counting. Sorry, she says, to make it supply chain. But really, what a supreme example of supply chain excellence. And as we all know, as many folks uh, know, the military kind of invented supply right. chain. And, and there's a supply <laughs> chain behind every single mission, logistics behind every single mission. So with all that said, um, 
Y'all stick with us. Uh, really uh, excited to bring on uh, ret retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Man uh, Mann in just a moment. But really quick, Mike, you know, since this is Veteran Voices episode, what I wanted to do is uh, celebrate a couple of things that, that uh, veterans in our networking community are up to as well. So uh, as I mentioned, Veteran Voices uh, is our podcast dedicated to the veteran journey. And Monica Fullerton is one of our guest hosts there. More importantly, Monica is a military spouse. She's founder and CEO of Spousely, which really serves um, military entrepreneurs, first responder entrepreneurs. It's like a marketplace for that whole um, global community. And she just was accepted into the Adastra, I probably said that wrong, but Adastra Ventures Get to Even Founder Bootcamp. So big high five to Monica Fullerton, all that you do, all that you do for the veteran community. And uh, from founder to founder, keep doing what you're doing. So we celebrate that with Monica. Also, Mike Griswold, Mary-Kate uh, Saliva. And she taught me her last name. She said, hey, my dad, <laughs> my dad said, just think, you're not going to leave me anywhere. So Saliva, <laughs> Saliva. But um, she just exited the Army. She is a wonderful, dynamic individual, uh, also a guest host with Veteran Voices. And she just got, uh, she just joined the organization, the, let's see here, PMI, Project Management Institute. So uh, for, for our listeners, you may have caught her on the um, one of our last episodes where St. Leo is, op is the first in the country to do a four-year degree program on veteran studies. So congrats to Mary Kate and Mike, I'm sure you've heard of and rubbed elbows with folks from PMI here in, in throughout your journey, huh? For sure. Great organization. So congrats, Mary Kate. We look forward to we're recording sessions with Monica tomorrow and, and, and Mary Kate on Friday. And then finally, you know, we can't make things happen without big supporters and advocates of our veteran community. Uh, big tip of the hat to Kelly Barner with Buyers Meeting Point and who leads our dial uh, P for procurement series. She sponsored uh, some recent episodes, including this latest one with Raleigh Wilkins, who specializes in helping veterans find sales careers and business development careers uh, and doesn't charge veterans a dime to do it. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. So check out Raleigh and uh, Dan Reeve with Esker on our most recent episode. And of course, all of that is done in conjunction with our friends from uh, the nonprofit Vets to <laughs> Industry which, you know, when I exited in 2002, it was tough to find professional resources and connections and, and just be aware of all the resources are out there for us. Well, vets2industry.org do a great job of giving veterans that information. So, Mike, information's power these days, huh? It sure is. It sure is. Okay. So, with all of that said, we're going to say hello to a few folks and then we're going to swoosh in our guest here. You know, Mike, that timer. Uh, it, it, we're just talking about Kelly Barner. She says this countdown clock makes me nervous even when I'm not hosting. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right, Kelly, you're right. Uh, Bill Stankevich is, is going to miss us today. He's on a plane guys everywhere. He's based down in Savannah. Uh, Mike, not sure if you ever met Bill, but if you ever, ever spend a minute with him, you love him in a heartbeat. Good people. Charles Walker, uh, former Army Ranger, if I'm not mistaken, but also a supply chain dynamo. Hua, uh, Charles, or Hua. Actually, let me say that right there uh, before Scott Mann makes fun of me. Uh, but great to have you here, Charles. Uh, Kav uh, Kavan is back with us. Kavan, great to see you here today. Benjamin Knights. So Benjamin's asking you, Mike, where in Massachusetts? He's in Boston. So I used to live in Taunton when we lived in Massachusetts. So that's south uh, in mean, uh, Benjamin will know where that is. It's south of Boston. It's actually closer to Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. Well, hey, the more you know. So, Benjamin, great. Thanks for tuning in via LinkedIn. Great to see you here today. Francois, great to have you via LinkedIn. I've enjoyed your live streams. So, great to see you. Uh, Jenny, as always, a pleasure, especially <clears throat> you coming off a busy week. So, Sheil is tuned in via LinkedIn. Peter Bolay all night and all day is with us here, tuned in from Canada on LinkedIn. Great to see you there, Peter, and welcome everybody. I know we can't get to everyone, but y'all, you're in for a treat and and um, a real story that you won't forget anytime soon. So on that note, Mike, are you ready for the for me to introduce the guest? Please, yes. All right, so let's do that. Um, so our special guest here today again is retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann president of Rooftop Leadership and co-founder of his own nonprofit, 501c3, uh, entitled Hero's Journey. He's a former Army 
Green Beret, so don't mess with him. Uh, multiple combat tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, he's appeared in a variety of major media and news outlets, as I mentioned earlier. He's been really busy here lately, as, as uh, thankfully a lot of folks want to hear his experiences and his team's uh, story. And in a really neat project, uh, Scott Mann is bringing his award-winning play, Last Out, Elegy of a Green Beret, to life as a major film. It's set for release in the months ahead. So most recently, what we're going to talk about here today, Mike and I is going to learn. Uh, Mike and I are going to learn firsthand. He's been leading these noble missions again, helping to get Afghan families out of Afghanistan. In my book, that's I know this. The word hero is thrown out all over the place these days, and and hey, with good reason. But this is a real hero, and we're going to learn it firsthand here today. Let's welcome a retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann. Hey, everybody. Good after or good afternoon. Great to see you. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. You too, Scott. Mike, good to see you. Thanks for having me. All right. So I, I got to, before we get started in the serious stuff, really quick, you mentioned pre show that you're a product of the Arkansas, Arkansas, Arkansas school system. So did you oh, grow yeah. up in Arkansas? I did. I, I, uh, my dad was a forest ranger, so we moved all over these little logging towns in the south. But uh, I spent most of my time in Arkansas. My uh, my alma mater, uh, my mater is uh, Mount Ida, Arkansas. You know, doesn't even have a stoplight. But uh, <laughs> man, I love that town more than life itself. <laughs> love it. All right, it's a good deal. So, Mike, let's get started. We're gonna talk with uh, with Scott, and it's okay to refer to you first. Day. I'll tell you, I, I get some military in me, and I'm meeting an off. I was enlisted. I, I feel obligated to throw on the rank on the front end. So I appreciate no, you. Please, please okay. don't, <laughs> please don't green, green berets. Uh, you know, there was a, I don't know if you ever read the cartoons, Willie and Joe, you know, oh. back in the world, the world War two privates that were always getting in trouble. And there's this one cartoon where uh, Willie's carrying his Lieutenant on his back and his Lieutenant's wounded. And uh, Willie yells up at him with bullets zipping all around. He says, don't mention it, sir. Happy to do it. They might have replaced you with one of those saluting devils. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right. Well, good deal. You're, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you're going to fit right in and, and uh, I appreciate what your team, you and your team are doing. So with that said, let's get a better, a little better. You know, beyond Arkansas, let's get a little better understanding of your background. So can you share a little bit of what you did in the military? Yep. I, uh, I spent about 23 years in the Army. Uh, 18 of that was as, a, as in Special Forces, Army Special Forces, uh, nicknamed mm. the Green Berets. Um, and I've wanted to do that since we were, I was 14 years old growing up in that, that little town in Mount Ida. Uh, Green Beret walked into our soda shop one day. And uh, as soon as he walked in, he had his uniform on. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't even know what he did. I just looked at that guy. You know those moments in your life where you know something shifts. And, and that was that moment for me. He sat down with me. And his name was Mark, and he explained to me what Green Berets do, how they, they're they different than the SEALs. SEALs have way better hair than we do. Um, <laughs> you know, Green Berets are, are, are known for parachuting in behind enemy lines. There's only 6,500 6, of us mm. in, in, in the military, and there's 1.4 million people in the military. So we parachute in behind lines, and then we what we do is we work by, with, and through um, indigenous people to help them stand up on their own. We're kind of a mixture between John Wick, uh, Lawrence of Arabia and the Verizon guy, uh, <laughs> or the Sprint guy, whatever the heck he is now, you know, but, uh, we're relationship based connectors and, and that's, mm. you know, and there, there's a degree of lethality in what we do, but the power in what we do guys is relationships. It's all about social capital. And then, then that's what I do at rooftop leadership. Actually, I've been retired eight years as I teach that relationship building skill. I still teach it to green berets. I still teach it to federal law enforcement because I've found it, you know, at the ripe young age of 53, that the, the greatest capital in the world is social capital. That's how mm. we are as humans. We're social creatures. And it, you know, even in this crisis, it's been relationships that allowed us to save a lot of lives. Yeah, well, you're preaching to the choir, and and uh, and thank you for sharing all of that because that that was all in my blind spot in terms of the Green Berets' main focus and and thrust. But we agree with you. Relationships is what drives supply chain. It's what is for driving sure. us through the pandemic and and getting the world to that post pandemic reality as soon as possible. But one more, one more question before I turn it over to Mike uh, for perspective and kind of also to continue to level setting. Can you describe what you what you did while while an active Green Beret in Afghanistan? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and 
what mostly what we did was we we build networks right so uh, we mobilize local people to stand up on their own and fight back from the bottom up so mm. we work with partner forces like the afghan commandos the afghan special forces we started all those organizations we trained them and then we take them into combat as advisors we fight right alongside them but we also work with local farmers to stand up on their own think uh, magnificent seven Right. And, and in fact, uh, Mike, I need to send you my book I wrote back in 2013. It's called Game Changers, Going Local to Defeat Violent Extremists. I'll send you guys a copy. But, oh, thank you. But it's what we did. I mean, we work locally. We wear indigenous garb. We grow our beards out. We speak the language. And, and that's really our strength. Uh, in any of these rough places where terrorist safe havens are set up, we can go in there. We stay. We don't, we don't go in and out with short strike missions. We can do that. But our real specialty is to get surrounded on purpose mm. um, and stay in these places, build relationships, and then go in with 12 and come out with 12,000. Wow. So when you think about now, you fast forward to where we are now, where the airport was completely surrounded. So if you think about that as a supply chain issue, right? The, 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 the problem was the bottleneck at the delivery end of the supply chain, right? And it, and it actually was not necessarily the Taliban checkpoints. That was some of it. It yep. was actually the perimeter around the airfield controlled by the U.S. And I can get into that if you want. But yeah, that, yeah. That's where if we ended could, up having to solve the problem. So as you, I bet you've been told before, you're already setting our community on fire with what you've shared already. So let me share a couple of comments, and then Mike's going to lead us into uh, – what you're getting to now, but I got to share Jenny completely agrees. Community is everything. Uh, Barb sexy. Great to see you Barb via uh, Omnia partners. Uh, she agrees with um, the definition of a true hero. So uh, thank you for being here with us, Barb. Uh, AA in Wichita, Kansas, old Mohib, who is a social uh, a supply chain professor says social capital words of the day. I agree with you there. Charles Walker, greatest capital is social capital. <laughs> he loves that. What's um, up, Ranger? So great, great to see everybody. All right, so Mike, uh, and keep the comments coming, folks. There's a lot more to come here with uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann. Mike, where are we going next? So I think, so Scott, again, it, it's a real honor and privilege to be able to spend some time with you today. And, and I definitely <laughs> look forward to the book. Um, that would be fantastic. You bet. Uh, really kind of two questions that you can you know kind of take anywhere you want. I think you were leading into it, which is as you're watching things unfold, Kind of what what was the kind of the why moment for you in terms of the things that you wanted to do and felt we needed to do? And then I think where you were starting to go, which from a supply chain perspective, I think is fascinating. And to the degree that you can share, maybe just talk us through the how. Yeah, happy to do it. Might even get on the whiteboard and draw it out for you. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> Love but, it. Uh, but what I, what I will start with is like, let's just work macro to micro. So, you know, um, when Afghanistan started to fall, you know, we were in this thing for 20 years, right? And everybody's got different opinions about it. What I will tell you is a green beret, right? I, I look at the problem set through the lens of capacity. So if the goal is to keep global terrorism at bay, which is about the best you can do in this day and age, right? Global terrorism is fueled by particularly Islamist not Islamic, Islamist violent mm -hmm. extremism, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is extremely persistent, right? So the best you can do is keep it at bay, at least that's been my experience, mm -hmm. then, then unfettered safe haven is the, is the worst thing you can have, right? We learned that on 9-11. If you give a, a global organization unfettered safe haven where they can rest, plan, project, that's a problem. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do in Afghanistan was to was to help them build both a formal and informal civil society that could uh, be an antibody at a local level to violent extremism so that they couldn't power project. And the problem is that country's been at war for 50 years. So every mechanism they have for conflict resolution, security, uh, food security, uh, food, food provision, all the things we take for granted in our contract transactional society and their status clan society, it's completely broken. Mm. And it's broken to the point of they rely on external actors to close the, their, their supply chain. Well, guess who closes it? The local insurgent, right. unless you can provide them with new patterns. Mm. It took 20 years 
I mean, they didn't even have an army. They didn't have a police force. They were in an ethnic civil war that had devastated them. So we spent 20 years just trying to cobble together, you know, an organization of military and, and police that could shoot in the same direction. So at a macro level, when we got to the 20-year mark and everybody was screaming, get out, we're not nation building, that's not the point. You're building capacity mm -hmm. to be an antibody to extremism. And we bailed on it, and we bailed on it fast. It mm -hmm. collapsed, and we found ourselves looking at um, a timeline that was untenable. And that's what got us to where we are right now. And it was heartbreaking for those of us. My son was three, you know, when the towers fell and now he's an infantry Lieutenant, probably mm. going to go over there and fight the war. I didn't finish. And that's a hard thing to stomach as a father. Wow. Um, well, Mike, I th that is a very powerful why. And I really appreciate the context behind, you know, kind of the, the science behind, you know, how the military got involved and, and the purpose of, of what we're over there to, to do. And I'll tell you, it, it, it also really sticks out. It seems like service is generational and it's passed. The, that baton has passed. So I really appreciate, you know, your son uh, fulfilling some of the legacy you're putting out there, wearing a uniform sure. and, and serving the country. And for that matter, so it's, it's bigger than that. As we all know, it's, it's furthering the cause of freedom and it's uh, empowering others to, to push back against tyranny as well. So I thank you. I can't tell you mu enough what how grateful we all are here. So, um, as Mike was asking, so beyond your why, because that's crystal uh -huh. clear at this point. Yeah, can you talk a little more about uh, the noble mission itself? What you know, going in how, here recently. Yeah. Let's let's pull it. You want to pull it apart? Yeah, please. Sure. Let's pull it apart because I think I think what you all you know you all if my goodness work in functional supply chains you're going to see the universal singular of this in a second. Um, because that's exactly what we were facing, right? And and so for Green Berets, first of all, let me let me clarify, we were not in country. And now that you've heard how we operate, it probably makes sense to you that we didn't need to be. Right. We had 20 years of pre-existing relationships with Afghan commandos, Afghan special forces, Afghan interpreters who fought and bled with us. And I'm sitting here right now because of several of them and what they did to save my butt, mm. right? And so when we looked at them getting rolled up, and their, their visas not being honored when they had been targeted and we promised we would bring them home, you know, I, we weren't good with that, right? We, we, in particular, there was one commando uh, named Nazam who I, I brought him in in 2010, this young kid, uh, and took him all the way through, went to combat with him. Um, and we maintained friendship throughout the years. And he was in severe duress. Uh, his SIV visa was not being approved and Kabul was falling. He was living in his uh, uncle's apartment with his family. He was not from Kabul. He was Uzbek, which meant his ethnicity is different than the Taliban. So how's he going to move through the city right. mm -hmm. to any kind of safety? And so he kept calling me. He's like, sir, what am I? He goes, he, and he said to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, my brothers are gone. And he was talking about us. Mm. And he said, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just afraid to die alone. Mm. And that hit me like right between the running lights. And, and, I, and I got on the phone with, uh, with a couple of my active duty SF buddies who had fought with him too. And I was like, we can't, we can't do this. This can't happen. And so I was like, who else do we know? Who else knows Nizam? Who else can make stuff happen? We got two other people. We got ABC reporter James Meek, uh, who broke the ABC story, and he's known Nizam for years. I called him and I said, you're going to have to come in off the record and you're going to have to shake some trees. And he's like, I'm in. Let's do it. And then I called <laughs> Congressman Mike Waltz, uh, former Green Beret, and I said, I pulled your butt out of Hellman province. I'm calling in a favor. And he said, okay, I'm giving you my senior staffer, Kelsey. And that was our team. And we went to work. And what we had to solve for, going to the whiteboard. Yep. Um, <laughs> but what we had to solve for was we had um, Nizam over here, right? Can you guys see that? Yes. Nizam. So he's got to move through the city of Kabul in all these complex street, uh, uh, places over to the airfield. Right over here. This is the airfield. And the problem is around the airfield, you have all these checkpoints along the way. And then you've got a Taliban perimeter all the way around. And then inside the Taliban perimeter, you have a U.S. NATO perimeter 
with the doors locked and you don't know what their schedule is and they don't have clear criteria for who, how, when they open. And you're starting to get between 20 and 30,000 people blocking here. Wow. Right. So think of that from a supply chain perspective, yeah. you've got a massive bottleneck, right? So what we did was we thought, okay, we have at least three or four strategic log jams here that have to be negotiated. And so what we did was uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, of time sensitive collaboration. All you really have time to do when you're dealing with something this complex and it's urgent, you have time to name it, frame it and tame it. That's it. Right. Wow. And, and so so to name it, we named it very simply save Nizam. Right. And we defined saving Nizam as getting him on an airplane and flying away wherever away is. Doesn't matter. Right. That's that's it. Hashtag save Nizam. Yes. So that's what we focused on at a singular level. So then we started pulling apart. What were the actual challenges here? We started with the checkpoints. Well, um, can I, Scott, can I interrupt yeah. just for a second? And yeah. this is fascinating, as, and we're getting a ton of comments. I love your approach here. But really quick, Mike, to have a singular, simple mission, as in save Nizam, yeah. we, that is directly transferable to, to global supply chain, really global business, right? Oh, it, it is. I mean, when you, we tend – I spend a lot of time with retailers. We we tend to overcomplicate the supply chain. We, we I mean, It's really simple. You buy stuff and you sell stuff, right? You move stuff in the middle, right? At the end of the day, that that's what a retail supply chain does. And I think – you know, when I talk to supply chain organizations, one of their challenges is getting very singular to your point, Scott, around why do I have a supply chain? What is it meant to do? And, and in this case, you know, saving the ZOM, it's, okay, what is your equivalent as a supply chain? What, why is your supply chain in existence? So this getting very crisp around why we have a supply chain and what problem are we trying to solve? I mean, that's critical. I'm, I'm with you. And, and you know what? Uh, you've got folks ready to run through the walls with this, with a lot of what you're sharing, but to include name it, frame it, and tame yeah. it. We're getting a ton of comments on that. So please, so you're about to, uh, now that you, you hashtag save Nizam, you, you're right. about to kind of uh, specifically call out some of the challenges you had to overcome. So please continue. Yeah. I hate to interrupt, but Dude, um, no, this is good, good stuff. Yeah, let's keep it. I want to keep this contextually relevant. So you stop me whenever you want and, <laughs> and, I, and I'll hit this really fast. Okay. The next major problem, though, were these checkpoints, right? This was a major, major problem because Nizam doesn't speak uh, Pashto. He speaks Dari. He's Uzbek, and he's not from the city. So he can't drive this, right? So what we ended up having to do was we tapped into our network. We started. I started calling people from 20 years back. And I found somebody, I can talk about it now because we're, we're out of this phase, but I found a person uh, from, a, from a friendship that I had built long ago uh, who drives a taxi who speaks Pashto. Now, <laughs> I mean, I won't get into the why, but <laughs> I did. And, and so this Pashto speaking taxi driver lo went to Nizam's house, loaded him up, drove right to the drop-off point without hassle. Wow. Nizam didn't even have to speak. My takeaway from that Build trust when risk is low, right. cash it in when it's high, mm. pure and simple. Everybody tries to build trust when risk is high. Hey, yes. buddy, what's up? What's going yeah. on? You're like, you can smell it a mile away. <laughs> yeah. You know, right? But, well, but as we've learned, way back. as yeah. we've learned in, uh, in the, this global pandemic area where thing, a lot of yeah. things buckled and, and uh, came to an end and broke, you know, folks were trying to microwave these relations, these this trust and relationships, and not just in supply chain, but elsewhere. And it, to your point, it just doesn't work like that. We exactly. all need, you know, blessed are the taxi drivers that that speak all the many languages <laughs> that we need to get through and to to really facilitate effective communication, which clearly was was a big part of a saving design, right? Yeah, it cracks yeah. me up how many people in the course of their day dismiss the people in their arena mm. as non-relevant and treat right. them as such. And you never know when you're going to need to pull that lever, right? And that person and, the, and the, you know, reciprocity is a fickle thing. It only works if it goes both ways. Right. Right. Um, and you build that reciprocity when risk is low. Um, yeah. So, go ahead, Mike. so I want to, uh, and whoever yeah. put, whoever zoomed in, that was a great move there, but Mike, you were going to say something. 
Yeah. So when we think about kind of supply chains in general, particularly during the pandemic, lots of discussions around risk management, contingency planning. As you're pulling this together, what are the one or two things that you're thinking? Because when I think about all the books I've read about special forces, it's we have a plan. It's probably not going to work the way we've completely designed it. Right. We, we need some contingencies. Here's what they're going to be. So as you're laying out this plan to get Nizam from the house to the airport, what were a couple things that you were really worried about? And then what was your plan if you had to, to go down that road? So we had, you know, I had, I had the conversation with him that, that you never want to have. It was like having a conversation like with my son. And it was just, it broke my heart was, you know, if you get stopped and they, they, and you, and they get your phone, you're dead. Mm. The, 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 the second they see these plus one numbers on your phone, plus they had compromised all biometric data at this point. So, you know, if, if so, my guidance to him was if they get your phone, you're going to have to shoot your way out of it, get to safety somehow, buy a burner phone and come up on the net, you know, when you can. And then because your safe house is burned, you know, you're out there. And, and that's what was so uh, nerve wracking for us. We were up for like 36 hours as his lifeline, you know, moving him and, and mainly to keep him because he was starting to panic and he's a warrior. But you can imagine the stress levels this kid's going through. So we stayed on the phone with him as we called ourselves his shepherd and just moved with him, you know, and he knew he wasn't alone. But th that you're right. Normally, I like to have a lot of contingency plans. I think every supply chain function, whether you're moving uh, unconventional things into Iraq or whether you're moving things across the world, you know, contingency planning really should have two things. You should have branches and sequels, right? You have branches for uh, um, what next, right? Or, you know, excuse me. Um, you have branches for what if. Right. So if Nizam mm -hmm. gets stopped, yeah. what if? That's a branch, yep. right? Branch off. You have De sequels. Decision trees. Yeah. That's right. And you have sequels yep. for what's next. So if he gets to, let's say he gets to here, what next? You know? Uh, and both of those are necessary in contingency planning. So uh, once we got him to here, we got him within four feet of the, we, and then he navigated the checkpoints on his own, uh, the, the, the Taliban perimeter. He actually just kind of worked his way around and got uh, up to one of the gates on the backside because he knew the airfield. And then now he's looking at a bunch of ticked off coalition guards <laughs> who are, they don't have clear guidance. They're not sure what they're supposed to do. Um, and he's trying to get them to open the gate. And we're like, Hey, give them your phone, give them your phone. And he's yelling at him, take my phone. You know, uh, they'll tell you who I am. They wouldn't take it. They pointed their weapons at him. And so finally he was getting the 10% battery life. And we knew if his phone went, we, we lost him. We oh lost gosh. our eyes and he lost his eyes. So um, we made one last ditch call. James Meek, the reporter, made one last call inside the airport. And he found a guy that worked for the, you know, on the diplomacy side. You can't make this up. <laughs> Happened to be a former Green Beret. And he wow. explained what was going on. He explained that in all these throngs of people, there was a commando who had gone to our qualification course at Bragg that was ready to be pulled in. And the guy said, all right, fine. If he yells pineapple, we'll let him in. And all, and we're like, say pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and all, and so he does and it gets, and the next thing you know is you see Nizam inside the wire with the guards, you know, like this. <laughs> and we just, you know, I just collapsed on the driveway, man. Mm. I just like, you know, and I, and, and all the pineapple memes are going on the phone yeah. and, and that started task force pineapple. So, so first off, as we all can acknowledge, Scott, man, can tell a story like few <laughs> others. Right. And I really appreciate that approach. That's it resonates. Great storytellers always do, but kind of kidding aside, we're talking about y'all's efforts saved a lot. That was, uh, had, had he got permanently disconnected from his brothers, as you put it, bad things were going to happen. And unfortunately, right. and, and I'd love to get your perspective here, Scott, and we're kind of, I'm trying to process the story that you're telling us and, and kind of 
um, uh, figure out what questions I'm going because this is very unique. This is new stuff. Uh, I mean, some of the supply chain themes are one thing, but to hear these uh, these human journeys is another another thing. But unfortunately, there are tons and tons of nizams. Can you can you give us any kind of yeah. context there? So what happened at that point was we were I was getting all kinds of calls from my buddies, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Army Rangers, uh, agency guys who were like, hey, my interpreter's stuck. Hey, my commando stuck with his family. And, and so our little team, we started calling ourselves Task Force Pineapple at that point. We were like, hey, why don't we just open the room up? Let's make every one of these men and women a shepherd like we were. We'll, we will give a situational picture in our encrypted room. And then we will let the shepherds move themselves to where they need to go. That way we can share information in real time, but the local relationship can exploit the opportunity. So what we did, what that's what we did. And so, and plus we had connections inside the airport, which nobody else had really thought about. Right. So we had now, we now had inside the airport commanders, sergeants, diplomats who did not like the orders they had been given, who intended to honor the promise, and they agreed to be conductors on our Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we started probing the perimeter, and we found holes in the wall. Uh, we found uh, uh, sewage canals, and we started guiding through situational awareness. So I'm, what I'm telling you is having a common situational picture in real time and the organization being able to talk to itself, but then having the local relationships that you can exploit to move fast and agile. And when we mm. did that, we scaled mm. and we got 700 Afghans mm. through in three days before the bomb went off. Wow. Uh, okay. So Mike, my, I don't know about you, but my mind yeah. is racing. I wish I had six hours and then some with uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott, Mann. what are, what are some things you're thinking right now? Mike? So when I first read about this, Scott, the, the whole, underground railroad really resonated with me in terms of how you were moving people through. And, and I don't know that anyone necessarily thought that, you know, we would be able to turn to something like the underground railroad and use it for a cause like this. If I bring us back to the earlier conversation around kind of contingencies, you know, when I think about supply chain capabilities going from one person to 700, it's about scaling. Right. And you just mentioned it's about scaling. Yeah. So as you're as you're thinking about, OK, we've got all these other people, you know, it worked for Nizam that I mean, because oftentimes people can do can do one thing really well once. It's how do you how do you scale and repeat that over time? So as you're thinking about, man, we, we've got people that we want to help. What were some of the scaling things that you were wrestling with in order to take this from one to seven hundred? Right. So the, the, the problem becomes, you know, the bottleneck becomes the Taliban perimeter and then right into the coalition per perimeter. Those are the two major issues. Um, the Taliban perimeter required a level of trust and relationships that's almost indescribable. And let me mm. tell you what I mean by and, and And so the local shepherd was critical. And remember now, these are all volunteer combat veterans. These aren't active. These are men and women with businesses like me. They are um, uh, school teachers. They are employees at Amazon. They just wanted to honor the promise when it wasn't being honored. And so what happened was the Underground Railroad actually was the idea of a retired 10th group special forces guy named Zach who teaches third grade and his hero is Harriet Tubman. And so he started, he used this underground railroad metaphor and set it up exactly like that uh, with conductors on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so it, we scaled that really. And the, But what I, what I want to point out here is two things. One, getting through the Taliban perimeter required a level of trust because the, the Afghan partner, the interpreter or the commando is with his family. And as they go through the checkpoint, the Taliban are beating them mercilessly, right? They're beating the children. They're beating the spouses. They sent some spouses into labor. They killed mm -hmm. some of the kids. And so the interpreter would be on the phone or the commando Ready, you know, ready to fight. And he's like, sir, please, can I fight him? And he's like, no, no, hold your ground, endure, get to freedom. Now you think about the level of trust that has to be in place between those individuals for that to occur. Um, and, and, and so the, the horrorism that those Afghans endured and their, their, their shepherd who was on the other line uh, is pretty indescribable. So that's one thing. 
when we execute in tough situations, we have to have infallible trust in the people that are executing. Like there has to be trust that is built before it ever gets bad. And then when it gets bad, we have to really believe in it, right? Mm. And let and really let it drive us through the rough times. But then when they got to the gate, that is where, in my opinion, storytelling in real time became the biggest issue. Mm. We decided at Pineapple that we were going to do a media blitz. I had quit the media years earlier. I hate the 24-hour <laughs> news cycle. I think it's the biggest joke in the world. But um, I, you know, that'll probably get me off the news right now. But <laughs> but, uh, but I had just stopped it because it was so partisan and I didn't like it. Yeah. But um, I went back on because I'm like, we got to tell this story and we got to tell it in real time. And James Meek wrote the ABC article in real time. And we were telling stories to the people on the inside in real time. That's narrative competence. When you use purposeful storytelling in real time to meet your goals, because the brain thinks in metaphor, mm -hmm. right? And so we were doing that and what it moved fast. For example, at one point in the canal, uh, British soldiers had seen the story on BBC. And so you have these partners that are holding up cell phones with a pineapple on it. And the Brits recognized it from the story. And they wow. pulled them in. They weren't part. We hadn't even called them, but they had seen it on the news. Wow. So, um, all right. So, so uh, as we start to wind things down, we want to protect your time. I know you're getting calls from every organization, which is again a wonderful thing. So we can get this narrative. What'd you call it? Narrative control out there. Oh, uh, narrative, think, narrative competence. It's the ability to tell stories in real time to meet your goals. Narrative competence. I need you to give me some lessons on narrative competence, <laughs> uh, Scott. Man, but hey. Um, all right. So you mentioned going back a little ways. You know, we love our metrics here at, at Supply Chain, especially especially um, life saving metrics, which these are seven hundred folks that you are able to 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 get help yeah. get out of bad places before, unfortunately, the tragedy that that struck a few days ago. Is that right? Yeah. And now we're pivoting into recovery operations with the government gone. And we're already we got a hundred people out yesterday. Operation Recovery org is in full swing. Wow. Okay. Um, so let's talk about how we can help, how, um, you know, whether you're tuned into this, this live stream in Arkansas or South Carolina or Ghana or wherever, how can folks support what your teams are doing? If anything that you've heard today, and I appreciate that, Scott and Mike, if anything that you've heard today, I'll say two things to that. Uh, if it resonated with you about honoring the promise, I mean, there's still 250 American citizens we need to bring in. There are thousands of Afghan high risk, like female judges, uh, young kids, young girls who are part of, uh, you know, in the arts programs, um, commandos and their families. If you, if that resonated with you honoring the promise, we could use some help at, uh, at operation recovery.org. And that's what we're using to move people to safety, but ultimately on to freedom. That's one. Number two, I absolutely love your vet voices uh, program. And I just want to tell you the play you talked about earlier. I wrote before any of this happened, I wrote a play about the war called last out elegy of a green beret. And it follows the life of a green beret team sergeant. He's a composite character based on three team sergeants I had who didn't make it home. And it's about him and, and how the war affected his family all the way through the entire war. But it tells the perspective of the family, tells the perspective of his Afghan uh, 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 surrogate father and elder and the abandonment that it, it's all that's happening right now was written and played out. We toured 16 cities. It was on Brokaw, uh, Good wow. Morning America. And now we produced it ourselves uh, as a film with, with all veteran supporters. And on 9-11, the behind the scenes is coming out of the actual tour. So you can see how, it, you know, how my midlife crisis really unfolded. <laughs> and then on veterans day, it's going to be out. The film is going to be out on Amazon prime on Google television, a couple others on Roku and all the proceeds are going to go to help Afghan resettlement. So you can see a real personal. And if you, if you served in Afghanistan or you want to know more about Afghanistan, you got to watch this film because it's all combat veterans performing it. So, OperationRecovery.org, if you want to help right now get people out, lastoutfilm.com. If you want to, uh, you know, this is the veteran voices thing. I can't think of a better way to tie in with that. 
And you can sign up to watch the documentary and the film right there. Um, it's really powerful. And all the proceeds help our Afghan brothers and sisters come home. Um, I cannot, you know, I know we've said it quite a bit, but on behalf of folks listening, of our team, of veterans out there that that have depended on these um, brave, courageous, highly capable and professional Afghan allies, we're immensely grateful for what you and your teams are doing and continue to do. So folks, we've dropped those URLs in the comments, both lastoutfilm.com and operationrecovery.org. Please support. And I'll tell you, uh, Scott, I bet beyond this noble mission that, that you and, and others are leading and driving and facilitating and, and saving lives, I bet you're going to have a lot of organizations that want you to come in and talk to them and, and not only talk leadership tactics and, and experiences and successes, but inspire folks to do things differently and just get stuff done. Yeah. There's tons of noise. There's tons of challenge and speed bumps and serious problems and non, not so serious problems. But at the end of the day, those got to be become nothing burgers so that you can get a GSD, get stuff done. And that's exactly what you and your team are doing. So that, very that, grateful. I appreciate, that. I appreciate that, Scott. And it's, it's very striking to me that that's what this group does is everybody could have just gotten ticked off. You know, the veterans could have just got mad like everybody else did, but instead they got to work. And I would encourage all of us to step back, regardless of our political affiliation, regardless of mask or no mask, you know, shake off that trance like state of anger and fear and look at the resolve that's playing out right now. And let's get our national narrative back. Let's get our myth back of who we really are. I mean, these veterans are showing us what right looks like. And I hope that we'll all get in line with it because we need it. I'm with you. And, and that that's also that being able to cut through the noise and cut through the vitriol. And again, to get stuff done, uh, the world needs that right now, but based Absolutely. on where we've been uh, the last uh, two years. So, all right. So Mike, I've been blathering away um because i i'm just there's so much i want to ask about and talk about here and we're getting a ton of comments i can't get to all of them but mike i'm gonna give you the last uh, question or comment here while we still have scott man just for the next minute or two yeah i think scott again thank you for spending time with us thanks for sharing your story i i think it's a great illustration we, we at, at gardner you know, we do a lot of work in encouraging, you know, the hiring of veterans. And I think, Scott, you know, your story is a great example of how to translate what you've learned in the military, the experiences you've had. How do you translate them, you know, into other scenarios and other situations and how you do that really well? And I think everyone, you know, if you if you aren't doing it now, I think everyone needs to really open their eyes to the value that veterans have when they come back home into our businesses. They, they can for, force us to think differently. They can force us to think more clearly. And I think you can never have enough veterans in your organization. So uh, again, really I, I really appreciate, Scott, the, the time and sharing your stories and, and the supply chain impl implications of, of what you guys did. Thanks, Mike. It's really well said. And, and I'll tell you, uh, our Heroes Journey nonprofit, I couldn't agree with you more. We do a lot of work with storytelling with veterans and military family members. I think it's the most important transition tool veteran voices can have is the ability to take their story about what I, I call it the generosity of scars, to take your scars from the military and repurpose them into the service of others. And, is, and that's what we need. And that's what these veterans did. And that's what any veteran can do is take right. even the trauma. You know, take the story and put it to work on how it can serve at home. And people people are hungry for it. Agreed. 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 Mike, I love what you just said there because organizations, we can't have enough veterans and all that they bring to the table. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Scott, man, uh, I wish I wish we had about 10 more hours with you. But I want to share. But I know you get plenty of accolades, I'm sure. I want to share a couple and then we'll let you get because I know you've got um, – book to book to book all the interviews you're doing, which is wonderful. Uh, we celebrate that. I love that there's a lot of interest. Really quick, Rooftop Leadership is your organization, rooftopleadership.com. Is that right? That's right. Yes, sir. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Wonderful. And okay. Benjamin Knight says, Scott Mann for president, please. I love that. Um, <laughs> I want to say, no. Uh, no. <laughs> Mohib no. says, real time takes on a whole new meaning today. Excellent point there, sure. Mohib. You're absolutely right. Um, Jenny, appreciate your feedback is also in your comments. Mark Preston, who's on the uh, board of directors with the uh, Association for Manufacturing Excellence, says, this was awesome. 
I want to share this with many Americans. Thank you. You know, I'll take that step further. The globe needs to hear this. Leadership is such a, a universal solvent. And Scott, you've yeah. got that in spades. Uh, Charles Walker is echoing that. President <laughs> Scott, man, oh, damn it. Hoo -ah. Airborne, yeah. 10 more hours. I love that. And, and there's lots more. But hey, Scott, really appreciate it. We've got your URLs. Of course, folks, we're going to make it really easy. We're going to put the URLs in the episode page of the podcast replay. If you're listening to this in replay, you're one click away from supporting the noble efforts and mission that Scott Mann and his organization and many, many like him are doing. And uh, Scott, I can't I <laughs> really admire and appreciate. And we're grateful for leaders like you that are um, it's about action. It's not about lip service and, and you're uh, you're an embodiment of that. So thanks so much for your time here thanks, today. Sir. I appreciate you, it. Scott. I appreciate you and Mike. We'll see you guys around. Take Alrighty. care. Wow. Um, Mike, you know, I, it, um, I wasn't exactly, exactly sure how this all would play out today. Cause this was, I knew this was going to be a unique conversation. Uh, and of course we also didn't, you know, we, I think we booked it. We, we confirmed it yesterday and, and then, you know, um, but I am so, um, uh, I don't know exactly. I'm, I'm processing one of the things that clearly sticks out clearly sticks out to me. I'd love to get your take here as we wrap. I got to protect your time too, is for all of that Scott Mann is doing retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann and the lives that he and his teams are saving. It is like he's sitting down on a corner market where we, we're breaking up bold peanuts and he just, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's just what he does. And that down to earth, I mean, that's how you create an army of followers, you know, folks that do it, aren't afraid to do it. And don't take themselves too seriously, even though they're saving lives. Holy cow, Mike! What do you? What comes to mind for you? Yeah, I, I think the the sentiments by by everyone on the, on the show today. I mean, I think just spending forty minutes with Scott. I mean, there. If he asked you to do anything, you would do it, right? I mean, his his ability to to boil the problem down to say this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. The, those are those are traits in leaders. And I think certainly going through programs, any of those special forces programs, those leadership skills get enhanced, but you also have to have something to start with. And you know, I think he's, he's a natural leader. He's a natural storyteller. I can't think of a better, you know, I think not, not to, not to bring, you know, faith into this, but I think certain people are at certain places at the right time. Mm. And I think he was certainly at the right place at the right time. Mm. Well said, as always, Mike, you're always, uh, you and Greg both always put things much <laughs> more effectively than I can, but you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we were talking about Dwight D Eisenhower, uh, pre-show right. and goodness gracious, some of the, some of the decisions he had to, 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 to make and just embrace what, what was to happen. So, uh, folks, again, comments, if, if, if what Scott Mann and his team are doing resonates, please check out their organizations. We've got, we've already dropped all the links there. Mike, I got to ask you, you know, I appreciate the hour you've, you've invested with us here as we've uncovered my uh, Scott Mann's story. But what is the latest with Gartner? What's what's next in Gartner world? Sure. So, you know, as with uh, a lot of organizations, you know, we've moved our in-person conferences um, to virtual. So we have uh, in a couple of weeks our European event is virtual. Uh, in October, we have our North American event is virtual as well. Um, same content, you know, same you know, great uh, sessions for people to to listen into. Um, and we will be kicking off probably, hard to believe it's September already, Scott, but probably the end of this month, beginning of next month, we'll start planning for 2022. And everyone is keeping their fingers crossed that we can be in person in June for our events. But the events, um, you know, again, it, it feels kind of hard talking about that after listening to Scott for, for 45 minutes. But um, you know, we've got some good content, you know, talking about resiliency and the role the supply chain plays in resiliency and agility and, and, and the environment. So yep. some really interesting topics we have teed up for our events. Always the best. And Mike Griswold, one of a kind, again, one of our most favored um, repeat guests that we have the uh, distinguished honor of having each month and, and sharing your expertise. So I really appreciate that. We had a double dip today. 
Uh, we went to Baskin oh, Robbins hi. and got one of every flavor uh, with you, with uh, you and Scott Mann. Frankly, Scott Mann, uh, the comments continue to come in, uh, and I'm not sure if our guests can hear us in the green room. I'd love to get a snapshot of the whiteboard that you just walked us uh, through, Scott, in case you got to yeah. depart. But hey, uh, as Kelly says, how are we supposed to go back to work after that? Yes. Amazing, old Clay, who's I part agree. of the production team. Big thanks to Clay and Amanda and Jada and Allie. He says, live stream, Hall of Fame. I'm with you. I uh, agree. Second that. <laughs> he says, whole new level, Mike and Scott. Now, uh, don't get me in trouble, uh, but I agree. Mike Griswold always brings it. Azalea says, use your scars. Use your scars. Charles Heater, always bringing the heat. You see the importance of leaders and individual contributors clearly at play here. One last thing before we wrap. Folks, one of the things that Scott Mann spoke to was – the uh, vast importance of a taxi driver that knew how to communicate and speak different languages. And as Scott mentioned, how many times do all, all of us are guilty of walking past people that we take for granted for the role they play, whether it's global supply chain or society and bless these folks, because when you need them, they're there and they make it happen. And sometimes they'll save lives. So, um, God bless our, all the uh, Scott man and all the Scott mans out there that are helping to make things right, helping get folks where they need to be out of bad places. Uh, the Supply Chain Now team's honored to, to host this conversation. Big thanks to Mike Griswold with Gartner for being my special guest host. Mike, how can folks connect with you? So, uh, again, LinkedIn. I'm, I'm working my way up to kind of average uh, LinkedIn user. Uh, and then mike.griswoldgartner.com. Those are the Wonderful. two easiest ways. Awesome. Thanks so much. Again, check out Scott Mann at rooftopleadership.com and the other URLs. We'll include that in show notes. Folks, this is an easy wrap. Um, yeah. But basically, be like Scott Mann. You know, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed wherever it is. And um, I'll tell you, tackle it, go out there and get stuff done. With, the, on, with that being said, on behalf of our entire team, we'll see you next time right here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.